Well, dear friends, we are in Luke 10 and verses 25 through 37, that which is known as the parable of the Good Samaritan, something that is without question one of the most, if not the most popular parable that Jesus has ever told. Perhaps only second to that would be the parable of the prodigal son as far as people knowing about it, even those who are not Christians know about the Good Samaritan, or they have an idea about this parable. They know about the parable of the prodigal son, and there is a great familiarity that we have and that even our culture has with the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, a simple Google search will overwhelm you with many, many ministries named after the Good Samaritan, Samaritan Ministries. Some of you are involved in the health-sharing ministry, Samaritan Ministry, Samaritan's Purse, a disaster relief organization. Friends, Samaritan Counseling, I found that early up on the Google search. Samaritan Medical Center, a medical center in New York named after this parable, Samaritan Inn. That's a homeless shelter. Overwhelmingly, there are many, many ministries. There are many homes. There are even, even, even aspects of church ministries that are named after the Samaritan within this parable. It is something that we must be careful of. We must be mindful of these passages with which we have great familiarity. Veggie tales had their own version of the great Samaritan parable. And within that, you had one group of people that wore pots on their head and another set of vegetables that wore shoes on their head. And they never got along with each other. In fact, they fought one with another because they were wearing different objects on their head. I trust that none of you are bringing that baggage into this parable, but you may still be bringing some baggage into this parable. We still may be affected by certain perspectives and not understand how the people in the first century would have identified and understood this passage, this parable. This is not a story of two people that were just a little bit different, or two groups of people that dressed a little bit differently, or ate a little bit differently, or liked things just slightly different, and we need to be more welcoming to people that are different. No, there's a history of bizarre interpretations of this passage One of my favorites that you will learn anytime you begin to study a hermeneutics class, anytime you begin to walk through a study of hermeneutics, the study of how to interpret literature, or specifically in our context, how to interpret the Bible, you will walk through poor interpretation methods, and you will walk through a school of thought known as the allegorical method, which was very popular in church history. And some will still seek to interpret things in this way, and The great St. Augustine is one that fell prey even to this method. Though we appreciate him in many areas, we appreciate St. Augustine in the area of his understanding of salvation, his understanding of soteriology. His interpretation of this parable is very interesting. In fact, he looked at it in this way that he interpreted each and every aspect of the parable through an allegorical way. This is exactly how you don't approach a parable. Primarily, when you see a parable, you need to look for one lesson or one thing that you need to recognize. Perhaps this one might have two, but you need, for the most part, to find one. But he found something around every little corner. The Adam was the man who was walking down the road. The man who robbed, at, robbed him was Satan. The priest and the Levite were the Mosaic law that went by, were unable to help him. The Samaritan is Jesus. The wine is the blood of Christ. The oil is the Holy Spirit. The inn that the man was brought to was the church. The innkeeper, this is my favorite, the innkeeper was the Apostle Paul. The two denarii are the law and the gospel. Well, that's a fantastic imagination, and perhaps you might like to show something with that, but to read such a parable and to get the idea that that was the intention of Jesus, that those listening to this parable would desire for you to walk away with that understanding is is very incredible because the next commentator, 
can come along and apply even new and more creative ideas to the parable. We can laugh at that, we can mock at that, but we ourselves need to be mindful. If we aren't careful, we can make our own errors with a text like this. There's an importance of, of being precise with a text like this and in interpreting it in a way that it was intended to be interpreted. Now, are there, there's a different ways of communicating. And Jesus, in this parable, I want you to see this, kind of goes through the back door in interpretation. He doesn't go right through the front door. Some people, like, just go through the front door, tell me how it is, and that's what it is. But sometimes you go through the back door to show someone the foundation that they're standing on, to show them that you're saying this to be true, but what you're standing on doesn't actually align to what you're espousing here. The way you're living your life isn't consistent with what you're declaring to be true about God and man. I worked in a pattern shop for a few years. A pattern shop is, no, I wasn't um, in textiles. I wasn't a tailor. This was a pattern shop where we made things out of wood, and we had to make things with great specificity, like even more specificity than you would find in normal carpentry or, or handyman work. And one of the methods that we used in getting such precision with what we made was not a direct method, but it was more of a backdoor method. And so we would measure precisely within, let's say, a 32nd of an inch sometimes with whatever it is that we were making, sometimes even a 64th. And we would draw our line cleanly, and we would cut the wood very near that line. But we would not try to cut exactly precisely because that was very difficult to do with that kind of precision. In fact, we would cut it, and then we would bring it to a large sander, and we would basically back up to that line, and we would end up very accurately because this is the standard. This is where we needed to be, and we'd just remove wood until we got to that place, and it was an extremely efficient way of doing that. And I thought that's how I want us to look at this parable. I want us to see how Jesus brings them in through this back door, where Jesus shows them the accuracy of the law in this respect, the ways in which they are declaring one thing to be true, but the ways in which they live their lives or the ways in which they desire others to treat them is completely inconsistent with how it is they are desiring to live their life outwardly. And this centers around a religious man, a, a self-righteous man, a man who is determining his rightness and his goodness and his ability to contort the law, to adjust the law in such a way that his standard of living, his way of existing, his way of walking through life meets this standard, but it's an artificial standard. It's a standard that he has created. And Jesus is going to demonstrate to this man that the standard that he is creating here is inconsistent with the way in which he wants other people to interact with him. It's inconsistent with the way in which he wants other people to treat him and his family. So we're going to see a test here. We're going to see this self-righteous man testing Jesus, or I will emphasize here, testing the law. And we will see this self-right, we will see Jesus testing the self-righteous man, and Jesus will lose, use the law in testing the self-righteous man. So we'll see the self-righteous man test the law of God. We will see the law testing the self-righteous man. Let's look at this first point. The self-righteous man tests the law of God. He seeks to test Jesus in his understanding of the law to see if he has a right answer for the ways in which they have philosophized the law. We can get into that in times where we just begin to walk around in this theoretical religion that doesn't actually impact our lives, that doesn't impact how it is. We can talk much but not follow through in action. Let's look at verses 25 through 29 in Luke chapter 10. It says, And behold, a lawyer stood up to him and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. 
And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Incredible question that he asked Jesus there, seeking to determine where it is that we define this concept of neighbor within this law that he agrees with, is within the Old Testament. We must give the lawyer credit. We must give this scholar credit. This is not like a lawyer like you think of a lawyer that is this working in a courtroom, is determining legal actions like our lawyers. This is more of a, a religious lawyer, one who is a scholar on the law, one who is coming to determinations and instructing others on these determinations. He has thought much of the law. We see something very specific in his understanding here. He understands the Ten Commandments. He understands the Ten Commandments are broken into two tables. You have the first four, the first table of the law, which is how you interact with God, how you love God. He understands the second table is how you interact with your fellow man. Love your neighbor as yourself. He sees the last six commandments falling into this category of the second table of the law. And he asks this question. Ponder the question that he asks here. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answers the question with a question, what is written in the law? How do you understand this, sir? How do you define this? Why would Jesus answer a question with a question? Well, I would say, why shouldn't Jesus answer a question with a question? He's going back here to this foundational principle that we find within the Old Testament. We find this in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You shall love the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 19, I mean, rather, Leviticus 19 and verse 18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. But think about his question here. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What does anyone do to inherit anything? Some of you have received an inheritance. Some of you will receive an, an inheritance. And what did you do in receiving that inheritance? Those of you that know others that have received an inheritance, what did they do in order to receive that inheritance? Well, primarily what happens is you inherit the goods of someone else that you are related to. Most often time it is parent to child that an inheritance is given. You inherit what you're given because of your relationship to that other person. He's not really talking about inheriting eternal life here. What he's talking about in his question is earning eternal life. And if you want to earn eternal life, you can look to the great many religions within the world and find all kinds of pathways that are given whereby you can inherit eternal life according to their perspective. And we can go back early into the pages of Scripture and find what we would call the covenant of works. This promise that God gave to Adam that if he will do this, he will live. We see that early in the pages. Genesis 2, beginning in verse 15, says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. There was a blessing for obedience, and there was a curse for disobedience. This concept of a covenant of works, this concept of being obedient to the law of God in order to gain a particular blessing because of your obedience is also seen in the Mosaic covenant. We see that here in many places, but we can look here at Exodus 19, beginning in verse 7. So Moses came down, he had brought the law, they had talked through the law, and it says, So Moses came down, called the elders and the people, and set before them all the words that the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And this covenant promised blessings for their obedience. 
So long as they were obedient, they would receive the blessings of the covenant. They were obedient, they would stay in the land. They would be fruitful, and they would multiply. Their enemies would not attack them. They would not receive the many curses that the Egyptians received. But they were told, if you are not obedient to this covenant, you will receive the curses that the Egyptians received. You will be even removed from the land. And we have this exact same picture here that Adam and Eve had sinned. They were removed from the garden through the eastern gate. And you have the Israelites that were um, disobedient to the covenant that they had made with God. They said, all of this we will do. All of that they did not do. And they were removed eastward. And they were taken into captivity. But we understand the greater Israel that is there, the one who has kept the covenant of works, the one who was faithful in every respect is our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ kept the covenant of works. He fulfilled the law in every way. That is why you have the gospel writers speaking of when Mary and Joseph and Jesus left Egypt and went back after the persecution of Herod had ended, that it said, out of Egypt I will call my son. That's what the gospel writer says. Why would they say, out of Egypt I have called my son, to say there's a fulfillment of this prophecy? But they're saying Jesus is that greater Israel. Jesus is that greater light of the world. Jesus is the one who is, will keep at that time and has kept this covenant of works on our behalf that we may receive the blessings of his obedience. Christ, that second Adam, the first Adam fell, and we fell in him. Christ, the second Adam, was obedient and he, all who are in him, will live. That is Paul's point many times over in Romans chapter 5. But such an understanding does not allow you as a person to believe that you can keep this covenant of works. Such a perspective does not allow you as a person to believe that you can keep the law in such a way as to merit yourself a righteousness. But this is a man who viewed the law in that way. And men that view the law in that way seek to do a few different things. They either lower the consequence of violating the law, or they lower the law itself. Or they will sometimes take a third category and seek to find other people that do bad things that they don't like, some of which are worse than what they have ever done, and use that as an argument as to why they should be accepted by God. And this is a man, it says, who desired to justify himself. He desired to make himself just to show himself to be righteous. One commentator named Garland says this, he says, not only would he justify himself before God by doing something to gain eternal life, he wants to present himself before others as a righteous man. The lawyer wants to know where it is that he can draw the line. I'm continuing the quote, what exactly can be demanded of me? Whom exactly am I supposed to Love, because if I'm really supposed to love everyone, everywhere, at all times, well, we have a problem. This, historically, in Judaism was known as halakha. And that was this idea, these lawyers, these theologians in Judaism would debate this idea. Where, In Jewish prudence, where is it that I draw the line? Where is the line that, that constitutes where I have to stand? E.P. Sanders, the great, theolo- the, the great uh, scholar in rabbinic Judaism during this time, says this, the goal here was to determine whether or not a biblical passage does in fact constitute a commandment, if there can be any doubt, to establish the application of the biblical commandment, to define its precise scope and its meaning, and to determine precisely what must be done in order to fulfill it. That's what he's doing here. He's seeking to analyze this, to talk about it in this very theoretical way, and he's seeking to lower the bar. Because if this really does mean everyone, he's seeing that he has a problem here. Who exactly is my neighbor is the question that he asks himself. Some had said a neighbor is just another Jew. Some had said, well, a neighbor is someone who is only in your particular sect of Judaism, religions all over the world seek to lower this standard. All of them recognize that you're supposed to love people. You can find that in all of the various religions. You're supposed to love people. But who it is in particular you're supposed to love and how it is that you're supposed to love them 
will vary within these various religious um, practices. Christianity is distinct in this respect. Certain religions, sex within Islam, will make arguments that it is okay to lie to unbelievers, to steal from unbelievers, to even murder to unbelievers. I'm not saying all Muslims everywhere practice that or all Muslims everywhere believe that, but this is something that is looked at within various uh, texts of Islam, and that's something that people walk away with, Hinduism. There are sects within Hinduism that will look at other people in their times of suffering and difficulty, and they will make an argument that you should not give handouts to them, you should not help a person in the time of their difficulty, because you're, you're messing with karma. Why is the person in this particular situation? Well, they're in this situation because of what they've done in a previous life, so you need not change anything here. And so we can walk through many different religions and find ways in which this, this law to love other people as you love yourself, and you find it very similarly stated in many different cultures, you see this lowered. And the lawyer here is trying to do something very, very similar. Why does this have to happen? Why is there a necessity of lowering the bar of the law? Why does a self-righteous man need to lower the bar of the law so that he can look to that law and see himself as attaining that standard of righteousness? Think of the story of Pilgrim's Progress. Remember Pilgrim, and he was on his journey, and he met a worldly wise man. And worldly wise man gave him a recommendation. He said he should go and talk to Mr. Legality, and he should go up upon that mountain and speak to Mr. Legality because he was a very reasonable man, very reasonable in his religion, this Mr. Legality that was a son of a bondservant. And he began to go upward to Mr. Legality, and this mountain that is there is supposed to be like a mountain of Mount Sinai climbing upward to God. And as they sought to climb up there, he was walking over these tombs with laws on them, and he had almost fallen. He had almost died. He had almost fallen over the edge. He found this to be overwhelming, this attempt to scale this mountain of God's law through his own efforts, through his own goodness. But he met a man. He met a man again, the evangelist. The evangelist, what are you doing? How did you get upon this mountain? I told you to walk to the celestial city. How did you do this? He was like the robbers that Jesus spoke of that climbed over the wall to get onto that narrow path instead of going through the narrow gate, that narrow gate that recognizes your sinfulness, your hopelessness in and of yourself and says, trust upon the Lord. Lean upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And he turned and he went toward the celestial city. You must not think much on church history to find a greater example of this than Martin Luther, one who was recognizing the highness of the law of God. He was a scholar. They had, they had given him Romans to study at one point. He was having difficulty with the law of God. He was struggling with his own sin and what to do with it. He was seeking to walk through these meritorious actions that the Roman Catholic Church had given him to do, whereby he could absolve himself of the consequences of these sins. So they gave him the book of Romans to teach through and to study. And it worked upon him even more and more. He struggled with it greatly to the point that he was beginning, it is told, to drive the man in the confession booth crazy. He was seeing not just that this was outward actions that God would judge, that the law required not merely outward actions and efforts, but rather it looked within the heart. It looked within the mind. And he would see the ways in which his heart wasn't rightly involved in worship, or he was despising one of the abbots within the monastery. He was seeing the many ways, and they were becoming overwhelmed with him as he was struggling with his sinful estate, for he was seeking through his own actions to make right what he had done wrong. He was finding even the opportunities that the Roman Catholic Church gave to him to be left wanting, to be overly, overly insufficient. What is the scope of this commandment? How should we understand this commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves? 
Because he asked the question, who is our neighbor? Is this all people everywhere? Am I really to love all people everywhere in all places? I want you to see something. We're going to walk through some of these commandments, and I want you to see what happens in our understanding of God's law if we lower this bar. We lower this bar, as many had done in first century Judaism, and said, well, it's just those that are Jews. Oh, we lower it and we say, well, it's just those that are like-minded, those that think like me. Those are the ones that I should love and those are the ones that I should respect. Think of the Tenth Commandment. Do not covet. We see that in Exodus 20 and verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Well, what happens here if neighbor is just someone over here that is like me or that I appreciate, or has the same point of view as I do, it's perfectly fine for me to covet what other people have. What about adultery? I consider this one in Leviticus 20 and verse 10. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Well, what if someone tries to be slick there and say, well... This is only the wife of my neighbor. Eighth commandment, Deuteronomy 22 and verse 4. You shall not see your brother's donkey or his ox fallen down by the way and ignore it. You shall help him and lift him up, lift him up again. Well, where do I draw the line there? Do, do I not have to apply this to someone that I don't consider to be my brother? Do I not have to apply this? We can find this in other places where the term neighbor is used. I want you to see something very particular here. And this comes out of a book that is within the category known as the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha is a, a series of, of books, writings that are coming prior to the first century, and they're Jewish writings. They were never accepted as canonical by the Jews. However, the Roman Catholic Church officially accepted them during the time of the Reformation, I would argue, in response to the Reformation, and some of these books as well are accepted by the Eastern Orthodox Church. But you see this within the book of Sirach, sometimes called Ben Sirach. We see this, it's in chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. And I want us to read through this, not that it's Scripture, but that it does give us an understanding of how people in the first century were thinking. It gives us a background some of these books during in the Apocrypha, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, they give you a background and understanding of things that are going on during that time. And it says this, If you do good, know to whom you do it, and you will be thanked for your good deeds. Do good to the devout, and you will be repaid. If not by them, certainly by the Most High. No good comes to the one who persists in evil, or to the one who does not give alms. Give to the devout, listen to this, but do not help the sinner. Do good to the humble, but do not give to the ungodly. Hold back their bread and do not give it to them. For by means of it, they might subdue you. Then you will receive twice as much evil for all the good that you have done to them. For the Most High also hates sinners, and He will inflict punishment on the ungodly. Give to the one who is good and do not help the sinner. Now look at that as a background in how People were thinking and understanding this concept of your neighbor at that time. This is written about 170 years prior to uh, the ministry of Jesus in around 30 A.D. And someone looking at a text like that could actually say, well, I could be sinning by helping this person, or these are my enemies, and I could give to them, and they could in some way then use that for the purpose of enslaving me. But contrast that, what you see within that apocryphal writing, with what you see in Exodus 23 and verses 4 and 5. It says, if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of the one who hates you lying under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue it with him. Do you see that? Do you see how this changes it? How would you want someone to treat you? That's the back door that Jesus is coming to here. 
not just the question of who is it that I should love or what's the parameters in which I should show love, but how is it that I want other people to interact with me? How do I want other people to interact with my family? How do I want other people to interact with my property? This commandment to love your neighbor as yourself without question refers to all people, and you can see it within other passages. But Jesus doesn't take that direct route. I know many times we want to just go through the front door, just be direct, but Jesus many times is calling people to think, calling, calling people to think of the foundation that they're standing on. Look at the conversations of Jesus and how unique each and every one of them are, how they, they are distinct. It's not the same rote pattern every single time, but rather it is a unique conversation. And so we see Jesus then testing this man, Jesus using the law to test this man. This man is seeking to test the law. Jesus, this, man is, this man is seeking, not Jesus is using, but this man is seeking to test the law and determine the boundaries to which his love is required to be so he can recognize that he meets it. But Jesus is turning the table on him and causing him to examine the principles, the foundations that he is standing upon. Not just his theoretical discussion of the law, or grabbing this text here from Ben Sirah and this text here and kind of thinking through them, and don't you know that you could be hurting God's people if you bless one of their enemies in some way, but instead he's pushing this back upon him and saying, how is it that you want other people to treat you? How is it that you live your life? And he does that through this great and famous parable. Look there at Luke 10 in verses 30 through 37. Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to a place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor of the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Give you a little background of the geography here from Jerusalem to Jericho. They would have understood this in the first century when Jesus gave this parable. But it's about a 17-mile distance. It's a 17-mile walk from Jericho to Jerusalem, and it was all uphill. Remember, if you're going to Jerusalem, you're always going upward. You're always ascending to Jerusalem. That's why they have the Psalms of Ascent. They would say those Psalms as they were walking upward toward Jerusalem. And it was about 2,700 miles above sea level. That's where Jerusalem was. Jericho was about 820 feet below sea level. So you see the dynamics there. You see the difficulty of such a terrain. You were walking in a very steep and barren wilderness. And this was an area that robbers would oftentimes utilize. They would take advantage of travelers as they were going from Jer Jericho to Jerusalem or from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho because of the difficulty of the terrain. There was also many areas where people could hide during this time, and so the thieves would attack unsuspecting travelers. So Jesus says there first came a priest. We see that in verse 31. Now by chance a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Jericho was a city where many of the priests resided. So the second highest residency of priests and Levites was in Jericho, second only to Jerusalem. And so this is likely a priest is returning from service to Jerusalem. It says he's going down. That's why we know he's going to Jericho, because if you're going down, you're going away from Jerusalem. Um, but why did he pass by on the other side? Many people ask this question. Many commentators have asked the question. We don't know 
for sure, but we can, we can have some reasonable educated speculation here that there is a concern of ceremony def ceremonial defilement. Perhaps this is a dead man. If a priest were to touch a dead man, he would be unclean for seven days. Perhaps he was afraid the thieves were still around. We don't know for sure. We have the same issue with the Levite, except the Levite actually pays more attention to him. So the Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side, so we have the Levite that sees him and then goes the other direction. And some of you may be saying, well, what's the difference between a priest and a Levite? All priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. Priests were those that were there within the inner sanctums of the uh, temple and the tabernacle. They, they worked those inner portions. They offered sacrifices. Um, they served more directly. The Levites were more on the outside. They handled kind of the security. Um, they handled the music. They did some of the services on the outside. Uh, the priest would guard the court of the priest. The Levites would guard the non-priestly courts. There were even qualifications. If you, you had to have no impurity or blemishes in order to be a priest, but you, you could have some blemishes and be a, a Levite. So they had different levels. One other interesting fact is a priest could mourn only those that were his close relatives, but a Levite could mourn anyone. So there were distinctions that were here. The Levites were basically a lower level priest in serving the, the temple area. And so the question may have been there, well, we don't know if this man is dead or not. He could possibly be dead, and this would be incredibly inconvenient. This would be a serious problem. Uh, this person, after being gone on his tour at the temple and working, is now going to have to return, is now going to have to go through a purification process. He's not going to be able to go home to his family. He's not going to be able to take care of his wife and his children. You see the arguments that someone could make here. I need to take care of my family. I, I can't help this man here. What if he's actually dead? Meanwhile, this is an injured man on the ground. How would you want someone to treat you if you were in that situation? Um, this is a problem, honestly, that has happened in parts of the world. I remember several years ago, there was a, a video that was shown and there was a man who had collapsed under cardiac arrest in the middle of a parking lot in Israel, and cars just kept driving by. They, they were going around him. He was getting in their way of their, their shopping experiences. Uh, it, was, it was a couple months ago, we were doing street evangelism, and there was a man who had passed out like right on the sidewalk. Uh, the, the man was, looked like he was having a seizure. I think he was overdosing in hindsight, looking at it, and it's brought to my attention, and I looked across the way, and I saw the man lying there, and you have these party goers, people going to clubs and bars, people going to and from Astros games, people going to restaurants, and they're, they're walking around this man as he's lying there on the pavement. This is right here in downtown Houston, probably 11 o'clock at night, and there's not much I could do for the man, honestly. I'm not I don't know how to deal with someone who is overdosing, but I called an ambulance, and an ambulance came out and picked the man up and put him in the ambulance. But there is this coldness that was there. This man was lying there, and these people couldn't be bothered to even call an ambulance. And many people had walked by during this time. And you see the same thing here with the priest and the Levite. The question is, how would you want someone to treat you how would you want someone to interact with you if you had been beaten, if you were lying there stripped on the side of the road? Would it even matter who it was that helped you? And that's where the Samaritan enters. Verse 33 in Luke 10, But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and we saw him. He had compassion. We've talked about the Samaritans before. They were enemies of the Jews. They were a people that were left over whenever the Assyrians had come over and they had removed the Jews from the Promised Land and taken them eastward into captivity. They were a people that they, they're Jews that were left in that area. They left some of the poorest people in that area, the least skilled were left in that area. And then they brought people in from other, other areas and brought them, other ethnicities were brought into that area. And it's our understanding that the Samaritans um, are the descendants of 
this, this people, partially Jews and partially some other ethnicity. And so you have this mix, mixture with them in their ethnicity, and then you also have a mixture, a syncretism in their religion, where they began to take some of these pagan practices and they mix them in with some of these uh, practices from the Old Testament. They would uh, use the, the, only the Pentateuch. They created their own temple on Mount Gerizim. You see that in John 4 as Jesus is interacting with the woman at the well. But why use a Samaritan? Why use a Samaritan? Jews at this time would have thought of the entirety of the Jewish people in this, this phrase, priest, Levites, and Israelites. That is the way it would have been said. And so even the Israelites listening at this time, this lawyer listening at this time, would have assumed that it would have been a regular Jewish person that was coming down to help the man that had been robbed. But Jesus put a Samaritan in there. He wasn't being direct. He was coming through the back door, as I had said. Anyone you run across is your neighbor. It, it doesn't matter. This is the point that is here. Your wife, your children, the rabbi, your pastor, any of these, your enemy, all of these are your neighbor. The question that is being asked here is, how would you want someone to treat you in this situation because the Samaritan was a, a great enemy of the Jewish people. This is the VeggieTale version does not even begin to communicate this, this idea. These were some of the greatest enemies of the Jews, not just because they didn't like them, but because they had done great terroristic activities toward the Jews. They had been hostile toward them. They had attacked them in ways of guerrilla warfare. And so it doesn't do as well to look at this through any kind of a a caricature that we see, we must see this rightly, that this is one of the great enemies of the Jewish people in the first century, and this is the person that Jesus inserts into this parable as the one who was helping the man, even though the priest and the Levite had walked by. That's what he's grass This is what we need to see here, that this is someone that they despised. This is someone that they hated. This is someone that they saw as a sellout, someone who had abandoned the religion and furthermore had been very hostile to the Jewish people. There are relatives of Jews at this time that are not alive because they had been attacked by Samaritans. They didn't merely not travel through Samaria because they didn't like Samaritans. They didn't travel through Samaria because it was dangerous they were a hostile people that despised the Jews. So there was great, great strife between these people. But he had compassion. It is the Samaritan that had compassion. The priests and the Levites couldn't be bothered to stop and help the dying man by the road. He had compassion. He went to him. The priest and the Levite had gone the other direction. Those that this lawyer respected, some of the highest people in the community within the story, are the ones that walked by. But it is this enemy that went in and helped at this time. He had compassion, not a mere feeling, not just praying for him, not just moving on, but had compassion. He used oil and wine, oil soothing the skin, wine used as an antiseptic. There's a component of worship here as well, oil and wine. If you understand the Pentateuch, you understand uh, the times of worship in the temple, they were very much used in worship in the temple. So you have these priests and Levites, priests most especially, that would have been using oil and wine in these, in these times of worship in the temple. But they use them not for this man by the side of the road, but it is the Samaritan that acts in this way and does something that is beneficial for this man, the Samaritan took the form of a servant. That's what you must see. You must see that this one that they despised, this one that they hated, is the one that took the form of a, a servant. So important, dear Christians, that the, the problems we have, we, we are running toward them. He not only helps him at this time, he not only puts him on his animal, walks him, he not only inconveniences himself, he not only risks being unclean in some way, he walks him to the inn 
And he pays, not just for him to stay there, but promises to pay anything, any other expenses that this man incurs. One that was a stranger. This was a Jewish man. That's the picture that is here. Someone going from Jerusalem to Jericho would have been a Jew. That is the understanding that is here. That's how the audience would have understood this. And this is a Jewish man that is being helped by an enemy, a Samaritan at this time. How can we see this and not recognize the ways in which we have fallen short in this, but also see the ways in which this is a picture? This is what Christ has done for us. The question is not, who is deserving of my love? Or let me draw the line, who, who, is, who is the one that I am required to love? That's, that's the wrong perspective. The question is, how would I want someone else to treat me? How would I want someone to interact with me in this situation? Think of all of the strife that was between the Jews and the Samaritans. Did the man on the side of the road that was beaten and stripped and left for dead, did he really care that this was a Samaritan that was helping him there? And in that, we see the perspective that Jesus is giving. We see the back door that he is bringing him into. He is saying, if you were the man that was on the side of the road, if you were the one who had been beaten, if you were the one who was struck down, if you were the one who was attacked and you were lying there, you wouldn't be asking the question whether or not this is a Samaritan. You would desire one to help you at that time. You wouldn't be asking, is this person deserving of my love? You would be asking, thank, you would be saying, thank God that someone is here to help me at this time. Thank God is someone that is, is here to help my family member at this time. And in seeing that, Jesus shows the man the meaning of this law, that he knows very well that to love your neighbor as yourself is to love all people everywhere and to treat all people the way that you want them to treat you because that's how you desire other people to treat you. That's the back door that he brings him into. That's how he, he sands this back to the line to show him the precision of this law. You know this is the line. Not a matter of how accurately you can cut this board, but you know this is the line, whether or not you can accurately cut that yourself or not. This is the standard, and you know it's the standard because that's what you desire from other people. I mean, think of this, dear friends. If we're only required to love those who are worthy of our love, if you only respect those that are worthy of your respect, if you only respect your children, you love your children when they're worthy of your love, if you love your spouse when they're worthy of your respect or your love, if you only love those on, on the outside, those that, that aren't Christians, if you only love them, all right, when they're doing things that are loving toward you, what do we do with the work of Jesus? Where does the work of Christ fall into this understanding of how it is that we should treat other people? In what way was Jesus required to show love to us? In what way was it necessary for him to condescend and clothe himself in flesh and dwell amongst us? He chose us. The Lord chose us as his people. Why? Because of our goodness? Because of all that we would do? No, he chose us even though we were enemies. Romans 5, verses 10, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Is that not a picture of what Christ has done for us? Jesus demonstrates the goodness of this. Jesus demonstrates how it is that we should live. It demonstrates the ways in which we fall short, which reminds us of our need of Christ Jesus. Jesus took the form of a servant on our behalf. Jesus lived this principle out. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Oh, the ways in which his kindness and mercy and love have been lavished upon us. 
look at the work of Christ and the beauty of Christ and what he has done. And we, we must not ask ourselves, who is it that I should love? Or what are the parameters of love that I should have? But to ask yourself, how have I loved? How am I loving other people? We must see the beauty of Christ and what he has done. There must be a motivation for us in, in walking in obedience. But Christ, Christ has demonstrated this greater love to us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. Praise be to God for the beauty of Christ, the work of Christ, the greatness of the love of Christ that has been lavished upon us, shown to us. We that were helpless, we that were enemies of God. Christ showed love to us through his life and his death and his resurrection, granting to us mercy, granting to us in his grace that which we deserve not that we may stand before God righteous, not through our own actions, but because of Christ and his finished work. Dear friends, trust upon Christ. Look not to your own goodness, your own efforts. See Christ, his beauty and his work. See Christ in his sufficiency. See Christ in no love. In Christ, in Christ alone can you truly love others.